This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 69, recorded on March 26th, 2014. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is no one. <laughs> of importance. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's Dixon de Baumier. Hello, Vincent. Dixon, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's not like I haven't seen you for a while. No, we, in fact, we've been sitting in your office for some time now. (laughs) In fact, isn't, don't you, the first thing in the morning when you come in, you come see me, you know that? I do, because, uh, you know, I like to touch base with the uh, capo di capo. No, I'm not a capo di capo, nothing. (laughs) There's nobody else around, that's why you come see me. If there were other people, you'd see them. Well, whoever I see first, I usually go in and schmooze a little bit. You like to schmooze? Did you used to do that in all your career? Actually, to be honest with you, I spent about 15 years uh, in an office in which I was either the only person or I had a technician working in my office on my um, my books, and I had very little discourse with the outside world, to be honest with you. But Wow, that is I, different from what I've experienced. I've always had people it. around. I've missed yeah. it. You know, so the moment I had my offices relocated over here, you know, it became a social event for me. Yes, you talk an awful lot. <laughs> I've been told that. Sometimes we do need to get some work done. And of course, Dixon Arc. doesn't need to get any work done. That's right. But uh, we appreciate the conversation for sure. And we I've often... learned to shut you out. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, a joke, I hope. I can't shut you out. Your, your voice is penetrating. There but you it's go. fine. It's fine. There I can go. focus. Good. Today is TWIP. It is. We do a number of podcasts we do. together, we and do. Uh, we've, we've we have to make sure the repertoire. we're not going to tell anyone about our new one. Not yet. Right, but there's a new one that Dixon and I have right. already recorded two episodes. It should be out soon. Yeah. And when it is on the next TWIP, we'll announce it. Right. Indeed. <clears throat> Indeed. Today is This Week in Parasitism, and we have a paper to discuss, and we have a bunch of email, too. We do. I can see that. Should we get to it? Sure. You selected this paper, which was published in Science this month, Yep, the year 2014. Yep. Oh, by the way, how's the weather? Oh, yeah. If you look out the window, it looks great. It's freezing but out. But if you go outside, uh, don't. <laughs> Just stay today, indoors. It's very windy today. It's not only cold, it's windy. So the chill factor, the wind chill factor is about probably zero, I would guess. The temperature is below freezing. I'm convinced of that. So we could look right now and it's just supposed to, It was supposed to snow today. That was crazy. It's supposed to snow today. But it didn't, this is it didn't. spring, isn't it? It's not What's wrong snow. with things? Gosh, Vince, the climate must be changing. <laughs> no, <laughs> Which is a great uh, segue to get into this paper, by the way. Oh, that's that's very good. It is does have to do with climate. It's currently one degree Celsius. One degree. I wasn't far off. And, uh, and what is the wind chill factor? going to go up to two degrees. Today. Yeah, the roll all the way up is going to double. The temperature yeah. will double today. So that is climate change. <laughs> so the paper is Altitudinal Changes in Malaria Incidents in right. Highlands of Ethiopia and Colombia. Exactly. The authors are Siraj, Santos Vega, Buma, Yadita, Carascal, and Pascual. Right. And have you been to Ethiopia or Colombia? I have been to neither place. That's surprising because you've been all over. I have. I've I've been to Kenya, which isn't too far away from Ethiopia. It's it's further south. Obviously. So these are on two different continents. Two completely different continents. All right. The first sentence of the abstract ah, tells yes. the story. It does. The impact of global warming on insect-borne diseases and on highland malaria in particular remains controversial. Indeed. What's a highland? Highland. Okay, so you have to know what a lowland is first. <laughs> know so that. <laughs> in terms of geographic uh, formations, right? right. Uh, both of these countries have uh, what you would consider to be coastal regions and lowland regions okay. of low altitude, all right, and uh, areas of maximum malarial transmission wherever water is found. Okay, so that in Ethiopia you have a lot of dry land. Sure. Lots of it. Sure. But that's the opposite in Colombia. You have Tons of, of wet, moist 
air laid, uh, laid laden. I will say this again. You have tons of moisture laden air, right? Which makes it a, a rather tropical moist climate, which as opposed to Ethiopia, which is not a tropical climate. It's a subtropical climate. It's found in northern part of uh, Africa. Mm -hmm. Yet they both have malaria. And they both have malaria because wherever you find water, you will find the vector. And wherever you find the vector, you will find malaria as long as you also have people. Because remember, malaria, human malaria at least, has mm. very few, if any, reservoir hosts. What would be the effect of temperature on transmission of malaria? How would it affect it? Right. So if you think of yourself as a malaria parasite, obeying the laws of nature, mm -hmm. uh, as all other creatures and all other biochemical reactions do, for every 10 degrees of increase, and that's centigrade, mm -hmm. you get a doubling of the biochemical reactions. In the it malaria parasite, up everything. So they reproduce more everything. frequently at higher temperatures, up <clears throat> yeah, to a point of which then they're killed. That's, that's right. So you get more sporozoites produced. Does that have? To, does that also apply to people? Do, Do we, we reproduce re more rapidly when the temperature yeah. goes up? <laughs> I don't know. We got statistics on that. I know what happens no in idea. New York when the lights go out. You have, you have blackouts. It, Nine it, months later, a bump, you have, yeah, yeah, right, a baby bump, so to speak. It's weird. <clears throat> well, you know, you have to take advantage of the situation. I guess I don't know. Well, you just I can't uh, really account for light that. a candle and read a book, or you get panicky because it's an emergency situation and you want to reproduce before everything oh. disappears. I don't know. I have no ideas about that. So, in uh, organisms that divide, yes, like malaria, they yeah. divide, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They increase or temperature replicate, speeds, replicate, replicate, they speed the up. Same with viruses. If you Indeed. propagate viruses at higher temperatures, up to a point, you yeah. get more viruses. So made. that we've had this discussion with regards to West Nile. So when the temperature, the air temperature, goes above 90 degrees, because mm -hmm. mosquitoes are cold-blooded organisms, the temperature inside and outside is about the same. So mosquitoes that harbor infectious diseases of various sorts that undergo replication cycles within them yeah. harbor more of that organism at higher temperatures right, than they do right. at lower temperatures. And so therefore, you get more bang for your bite, so to speak, and so you inject more of a certain thing into uh, a host. Mm -hmm. And one off the top of your head, you'd think, well, isn't one enough? Right. And the answer is, of course not. More is always better, right? More is better, but... In terms <coughs> when we're talking about initiating me, infections. Anyway. That's correct. Same it's, with viruses. It's almost never one. Right. It requires multiples in order to succeed. Because not everyone is successful. Many, many events fail. Right, and you've got an immune system that takes care of all That's those right. things too, right? Now, the other factor is the range of the mosquito, right? Right. Now, remind us again, uh, the pa Plasmodium falciparum yes. likes what mosquito? Uh, anopheline. Anopheline. Right, as now, opposed to culicine. Do we have anophelines here in you bet. the U.S.? Of course we do. But they die over the winter, right? Uh, many of them do. So you can't maintain a transmission Though They're not cycle. tropical mosquitoes. That's a very good point to make because if you liken the transmission of viral infections from mosquitoes and protozoal infections from mm -hmm. both mosquitoes and other vectors as well, mostly the viral infections remain. If the mosquitoes overwinter as adults, and many mm -hmm. of them do, then the organism inside survives too. Right. <clears throat> but so if the adult mosquitoes yeah. don't survive the winter or overwinter, with uh, protozoal infections, the data are less clear as to what happens to the pathogens inside those uh, vectors. Have we, did we ha I know we mentioned this before, but we, you have to remind me, did we have malaria in this part of the U.S.? We've had, we've had huge outbreaks of malaria really? in the United States. Huge. In New York City? <coughs> yes, in New York City. In the early days of New York City, absolutely. How, Staten Island was a hotbed it, for malaria. How transmission. did it get here? Immigration? Uh, there are two routes. Oh, well, obviously, it had to get here by immigration. Yeah. Sure. And it came originally from some Europeans because malaria is found throughout the Mediterranean basin. Yeah. So it could come from Italy or Spain or France, the southern part of France. But it could also come from Africa, for instance, when, when slavery was uh, in vogue in this okay. country. You can bring a lot of malaria in like that as well. And they did, of course. So uh, there are multiple ways in which uh, the malaria parasite can reach. And we had outbreaks, actually. We here. did, lots of them. In fact, the last mm. 
autochthonous outbreak of malaria. What does that mean? Means within the given region, not imported. Not imported, right? Right. It was in Minnesota in 1952, as I recall. Wow. In Minnesota, what must have been. Doing? This must have been in the summer, right? It was always in the summer. When the mosquitoes right. are yeah, are, are reproducing uh, exactly. and flying about and biting. Exactly right? right, and the number of sporozoites inside each mosquitoes goes up. It's funny because one of the common sayings that I heard attending American Society for Tropical Medicine meetings mm. was, "The best cure for a tropical disease is." Winter. Winter, yes, you've said that before. <laughs> so the, did they stop these outbreaks with intervention? They did. What they did they did. do, They spray? did two things. They did two things. They, first of all, they cured the infections, right? When we got a decent drug, in this case it was chloroquine, mm. uh, and before that was quinine, okay? Um, and quinidine was also in there some ways as well. So these are all... Uh, I'm going to make a mistake here, so I'm going to say quinolones, but they're not quinolones. They're, they're, they're something else. And we can actually check the internet to find out exactly what they are. What should I search are. for? Quinine. Do it's you want the, to know one that? of the oldest and most successful drugs in the world. Quinine. Brand and, name Qualaquin. Qual- uh, what do you want to know? I want to know what kind of a compound it is. Um, Quinolone. Uh, let's look. Quinine uh, is a natural white crystalline. Right, right. <laughs> having Derived antipyretic. From a tree. <laughs> uh, it naturally occurs in the chinchona tree. That's right. right. It's dihydroxy chicken wire. It's dihydroxy chicken wire. That's right. But it's got a name. It's. It's. I'm sure that there's a, a bunch of people out there listening right now that say this They're guy. probably going crazy, right? <laughs> I know what it is here. Call on me. <laughs> well, that's why we should have... Um, <laughs> Call in. <laughs> no, no, if we did this live, we could right. have a chat room and people it would could... Be uh, very interesting to hear. All right, let listening. me just, I'll do a better search. Quinine. Chemical structure of quinine, and then it'll just tell you what it is. Well, I, I see the chemical structure. Yeah, but it, they can tell you what kind of a chemical structure. That's what I'm driving at. Because there's a family of these uh, compounds that are derived from quinine. Chloroquine is one of them, and mefloquine is another, uh, which revolutionized the way we treated malaria in this country for many years. <laughs> Quinine is in, in the still class of compounds. tell you what it is. It's right in the here. class of compounds known as antimalarials. Isn't Fine. that great? <laughs> no, that's not so good. <laughs> Pharmacology of quinine. Pharmacology of quinine. You'll get it that way, I bet. So uh, the point is that... Uh, yeah, they use that to treat these outbreaks in the U.S., We right? could treat the outbreaks, and then once the outbreak has been treated, all right, yeah. and you've got winter coming on, uh, the chances for transmission in the next year were greatly reduced because again there's no reservoir hosts for this right yeah you could have people coming to minnesota though from places like the south where you've got uh, transmission all year long low levels in the in the winter no, so high it doesn't overwinter summer. basically there's not enough overwintering i think that's true although i'm gonna say it in a way that i don't know the answer to okay. that well that I, makes I, sense i'm not gonna commit on that one. I think it can winter over, but in very low levels. Uh, yeah, I mean, that makes sense that the levels are not sufficient in that's the spring right. to initiate another round of I outbreaks. I would think that's true. Whereas in tropical areas where mosquitoes are around all year round. Yeah, there are waves that move from the heated zones up into the cooler zones as the temperature rises in the cooler zones that spreads malaria from these uh, hotter locations into the cooler locations. So mosquitoes, pref- if there is a, in a country... A gradient of temperatures, cool right. to warm. The mosquitoes right. will stay in the warm areas? The Anopheline mosquitoes tend to do that because their breeding sites are well-defined. And if you look at what mm-hmm. they are, of course, there are multiple species, but in Africa, it's okay. probably uh, Anopheles gambii. Uh, they, they like the lowlands and the swampy areas to, to breed in, although they require right. clean water in which to do it. Now, we, we previously <laughs> talked about the fact that uh, the, the global climate change is expanding the range of malaria from Indeed. the equator. Right? That's right. That's right. And I presume there have been studies on that. This one is actually a different issue. That's right. This is about elevation. This is exactly because they right. say the the elevation uh, has never really been properly investigated in its right. impact on malaria with, transmission with respect to climate change. And that's so let's, the big. Let's talk about that. What is climate big change? D- uh, okay, so climate change is that re- what happens from morning to noon? No. <laughs> Even from day to day, no. From year to year, no. Decade to decade? Decade to decade, yes. So what's the trend, the current trend from decade to decade? Okay, let's go back okay. pretty far. Let's go back 20,000 years. I'd love to. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> no, just take a time machine and you visit. You don't like cold weather. <laughs> Edward, 
I would take some samples. It was cold back then. It was, really it was cold. in one of the ice ages. Hence, it was the last ice age. The last ice age we had was 20,000 years ago. So the ocean levels 20,000 years ago were 150 feet lower than they are today. Because a lot of the water was frozen? Correct. Hmm. At the poles and in glaciers. Why did it get so cold? That's a hell of a good question. And if you could answer that one, I think we would be able to predict when the next ice age would be. Well, we're not going to have another ice age because we're <laughs> well, cranking out all this greenhouse gas that's well, warming up the earth, you'd right? You'd think so. You'd think so. But there still might but be. But why did it get cold? We don't know, that's right? right? No, that's exactly right. It could there are no, there are no written historical records. Right? <laughs> well, there are in the bubbles of the ice that are trapped in these large uh, deposits, okay, in Greenland and, for instance, in the ice Siberia? sheets of, of uh, Siberia. Yeah, but they also look in, in Antarctica because yeah. those are two completely poles apart areas, right? Greenland and Antarctica. So there's still ice in these areas that was Tons frozen 20,000 years that's ago. That's correct. And they can tell and what the ratio of, of O18 to O16 is. Two isotopes of tell, oxygen. Mm -hmm. Right. Then they can tell what the temperature was based on those two ratios, all right? Those two uh, oxygen It doesn't tell you the say. cause, though. Still doesn't tell you the cause. So, What are some be, of the ideas? Some ideas relate to the fluctuation in the solar constant. Okay. Things that are completely esoteric to most right. people. So anyway, 20,000 years ago, it was very cold. It was cold, and then it started to get warm. Okay, so this is called an interglacial period. We are now in an interglacial period. We don't know how hot it's going to get before it starts to get cold again. Because if you go back in time before 20,000 years ago, if you go back like say 200,000 years ago or, or 300,000 years ago, and there are still some records that you can access from those time points, mm -hmm. we've had multiple ice ages since then. And it hasn't been at such regular intervals that you could say, sure, sure. this is what's causing but it. it did, and it did get warm, but not... As warm as it is oh, now, no, correct? No, that's not true. It's, it got really warm? It could even get warmer. That's interesting because today we blame, we put right. a large part of the we warming do. on global, on do. greenhouse gas emission, that's right. right? That's right. But back then, actually I've read that there was a lot of burning of forests by right. humans and that could have contributed, right? That's correct. Well, yeah, but I mean, I, I wouldn't go that far because no. there weren't that many humans. <laughs> okay. But there are other causes well, for global certainly, climate change. Certainly clear cutting is nothing new. No. We but, used to clear cut before we had axes, yeah, probably. That's right. That's right. But when a volcano goes up and puts stuff in the atmosphere, and the, yeah, and yeah the, that'll do it. And then we start to cool down. It puts CO2 in the atmosphere, but it also puts particulates in the atmosphere, right? Okay. When the particulates go in the atmosphere, it reflects sunlight back into outer space and the temperature's cool. Sure. Okay. But then the particulates disappear, but the CO2 is still there. And at that mm -hmm. point, the temperature goes back up again. And so that happened, actually. We could have measured one of those events, the Mount Punatubo uh, explosion of that volcano in the Philippines, uh, actually resulted in a decrease in the global climate temperature profile, so by about two degrees. But the, when the particulates disappeared, the climate change issue resumed where it would have been if the, if the uh, volcano had not exploded. So it proved that the Got trend it, yes. was ongoing rather than uh, just uh, fluctuating. Up so and down we're like currently that. in a period where, the, you know, from decade to decade, there's a change in the climate. That's what we think. But you know, that when they started to think this way, of course, they began to take measurements, and yeah. the measurements were short term. Okay, the very first ones they took when they started to get this idea, but maybe we're altering mm -hmm. the temperature of the Earth, and they they got a hint from that from the CO two that rises. But does that correlate to an increase in temperature? And so they began to measure both of these things, and then lots of other things came into play too, like distribution of species. And that mos mosquitoes play into this thought pattern. But the ones they really paid attention to in the beginning were trees. Mm -hmm. All right? So certain tree species are delineated in terms of their ranges by temperature. And to notice the increase of trees of that particular species that march either further north or south, depending on which hemisphere they're in, as the result of climate change and global warming, as it's called also sometimes, was very telling to some people. They said, these trees were never found here before, and now look at them. They're here, and they're, they're very comfortable here. And the reason why they're comfortable is because we know what their temperature range is, and that's changed. So that's really tangible evidence to say that, yeah, the climate has changed. As long as you know that the tree cannot grow when it's cooler. Correct, right? and you can tell that by just looking at where they're growing and then taking temperatures and correlating those two things together so we can actually take the temperature of the mm -hmm. Earth from outer space. 
We can tell what temperature it is at any given moment. So you're saying we could use malaria to do the same thing? It's a bioindicator. Or any yeah, vector-driven, yeah, right. temperature-dependent That's phenomenon. You got right? it. You got it. So in this case, it's mm. disease transmission yeah. and the zones of disease transmission. If you think you're safe because you live at 7,000 feet, guess again. Are we safe here in New York? Always, but you know we're a big traffic area here, so we've got three major airports in the area. <laughs> we can easily introduce malaria again, and we've done this many mm. times. So that's called airport malaria. But it could also result in the establishment of malaria in, in local populations of mosquitoes, and that's happened. Yeah, but if we lost our winter, if it one day was a continuous <laughs> summer, then that's we'd have the malaria. Fear. The fear right. is that if you reintroduce it, it won't go away again. Can just you like imagine if the entire Earth was continuous summer? It'd be malaria everywhere. Which it was at one time, by the way. It thought it was thought to be all tropical at one point. And there weren't any humans around. No, no there So were there dinosaurs. wasn't there wasn't any human malaria. But that's correct. No, there were dinosaurs. Now this uh, whole issue of climate change is very controversial. Well, not so controversial no? anymore. It used to be controversial when people began to doubt the data because they said you're not taking it at intervals long enough to really see the differences. But now we have technology that allows us to go back and further in time. Mm -hmm. We have ice core samples that are 15 and 20 and 30, 40,000 years old. We can date these to, to the exact moment in time. We can, through these ice cores, I can show you when the Industrial Revolution began. Yes, but you can find today people who say that I know. Well, climate change is you know not what? real, and they dis <laughs> it's sort of like the anti-vax yeah, crowd. I know, I know. Right? They're still counting angels on the heads of pins and things but like that. But that has, sort. as we discussed before in the pre-show, that has other yeah. origins yeah. because it's a monetary thing. Which and it's we not going to matter if they believe it or not. It's, it's just going to happen. But what will matter is that some of these people are in control of policy. Right. And policy drives our political systems, which drives our social systems. And if we can't come to consensus that we got to do something now to slow it down, it doesn't matter who or what is doing it, we can take measures to slow it down. And one of those big measures is to use less fossil fuels. Right. And that hits them right in the pocketbook because, you know, what's going on in the U.S. right now is fracking all over the place. And and that's contributing to global climate change. And if you said stop it because it's going to get worse if you keep it up, there are lots of people out there that are not willing to do that. Okay. Now, that's in this issue. study... Those are the issues that I see, at least. The point here is that from 1970 to 2000, there's been an increase in documented malaria right. at different parts in Africa. That's right. Okay. And um, this is before the intervention, the massive intervention efforts of the last decade. So yeah. you can try and correlate these with That's right. temperature. They have good records. And they say they have very good records, mm -hmm. but what they have not been analyzed for are spatial temporal right. quality. Right. right. Meaning? Well, temper temporal <laughs> is time. Right. So from 1970 to 2000, right. spatio means where you are. Correct. Could be left to right or up and down, that's right, right? Exactly right. And in this paper, they want to see up elevation. That's right? right. That's right. Because that's right. Uh, at higher elevations, it's cooler normally, and you don't have you have less malaria, right? Yeah, because I can tell you, it's a simple correlation. Because flight wing muscles of mosquitoes are dependent on the ambient temperature, and the ambient temperature, mm -hmm. if it's cooler and higher temperatures at night, they fly less during the daytime because it takes them longer to warm up. They're not cold-blooded, are they? They are very cold-blooded. <laughs> they have no blood. <laughs> They're no-blooded, in fact. They have hemo hemolymph. Yeah. So they have, to, they have to come out from their hiding places in the mornings. They're hiding underneath leaves, mostly. Yeah. And they sit on the top of those leaves, and they wait for the sun to warm up their flight wing muscles so that the biochemical right. reactions that I just mentioned before can, yeah. can function. So basically, a cold-blooded creature is at the mercy of the temperature of the that's environment because right. that's what the body temperature will be Bingo. as opposed to you and i who maintain right. a core temperature that's exactly constant right. no matter if it's cold like today yeah or really hot so some people live at those higher temperatures all year yeah. they don't care because they just bundle is, up a little bit is 37 degrees that's right? right that's right all right so they basically collected a lot of data they did and analyzed it they did. And, and you know they do say here that previously and if you look at the old records Mm -hmm. Bef before the years that we're looking at, yep. when you went higher yep. elevation, you have 
less malaria Correct. in areas, of course, where there is malaria to begin with. That's right. It's like looking at those trees and saying they don't grow beyond this zone. Yeah, a tree line, right? No, that's right. Exactly right. And But I would argue that's because there's not enough oxygen. Uh, would that be not wrong? Really, not really. Not at that level. Now there's still plenty of oxygen. There's still plenty of oxygen? <laughs> I mean, there's less, but there's still plenty. All right. So they took um, data from... Ooh, the wind. You hear that? Wow. <laughs> Speaking of oxygen. <laughs> no mosquitoes out there. Not today. <laughs> the, there's plenty of birds, though. Uh, why do they fly in weather like this? That's another show, Doesn't bother of course. Them. <laughs> Doesn't bother them. I would be huddled up underneath some heating device. So they have monthly plasmodium falciparum cases. Correct. Now, falciparum is the more virulent, right? It's the most virulent of all the four and species. And the most common in it humans? still is the most common. Yes, it is. And it's, so it's the most that's troubling. Right. That's yeah. correct. It causes more infant mentality than any other species. So they have for 124 municipalities in a specific region of Western Colombia, which is in South America, right? Right. Uh, from 1990 to 2005. Right. And then from 159 administrative units in a certain area of central Ethiopia from 1993 to 2005. Right. So they chose two areas that were socially well organized so that they could mine mm. the data from their clinics and get a pattern for disease transmission at various times. And because we know what the temperature was and we know how high up these people lived, you could do these studies. And they did this on purpose for two completely different geographic regions just to show how universal this phenomenon was. And so they did a lot of statistical analysis, most yes. of which escapes my uh, quantitative well, uh, skills. Well, both of our feeble <laughs> minds. But <laughs> right. the, one of the reasons they have to apply a lot of statistical procedures is they want to remove other possible confounding That's right. variables. That's right. Um, there are other things that can influence transmission of, of a course. disease, right? Absolutely right. And uh, there can be other environmental factors. It could be per people related factors. Yeah, you know, I mean, the what density if people, of people at higher altitudes used bed nets more often? Yeah, exactly. So they try and do away with all that. And right. what they find in right. the end is basically that over time, the median altitude for case distribution increased with mean temperature. Exactly. So it, that's well, what was suspected. But now Never they proven. Have, they have very Malaria good cases now. occurred at higher elevations in warmer years. Right. Than in both areas, right. both Colombia and, e and exactly Ethiopia. Right. Exactly right. So exactly. In 1997 so and 2002, it can't be coincidental. They were distinctly warmer years. This is right. And the malaria went higher up. You know in what? Those years. So that's irrefutable evidence, isn't it? Well, Dixon, can it be I can still I can still argue <laughs> that there is another unknown factor. Keep going. That is making the increase in malaria and it's not temperature maybe it's something else that they didn't right. look for you know right. these things happen you can right. often be confused i know so i would ha i would say that you need to probably do this at a number of other sites so they have this really remarkable figure which illustrates this result they have a set of maps from the two locations right columbia and they have one one uh, they show where you have the most or the the increased malaria cases, right? <laughs> and then in the other, they have the temperature, right? Which it was also which measured, right? That's right, and, and they, it totally they corresponds. They overlap completely. That's right. Which is so visually very striking. Yes. Now they say here, so this is two different continents. Correct. We're getting the same effect. Correct. So I would say yes, it seems likely, but I still <laughs> worried that something else is confounding it. Yeah, okay. They say. The synchrony may be due to El Nino events. Ah, so this is a good chance for you to tell us what El Nino, and what's the other one? The Pinta? La the Pinta? La Nina. I know. <laughs> La Nina? So La the, Nina the and El Nino. boy and the little girl. What's that all about? The mischievous little boy and the mischievous Can little girl. Can we change girl. that? Can we get rid of it? No. We, first of all, uh, so let's what describe it? it first. Okay, so let's go back in to another concept, and that is, um, so here's the question that everyone wanted to know the answer to, and then they eventually found out what that answer was. What creates Earth's ambient temperatures? Yeah, I know, because I already answered your question. Right. What does it? I mean, where does it come from? Does yeah. it come from the amount of sunlight going through the clouds or not, and then bouncing off the Earth or not? And then is it is it from the sun itself that the Earth's temperatures are are determined, mm -hmm. 
or is it a is it a secondary effect of the sunlight striking something, absorbing into it, and then re-radiating the heat? Right. The answer is <laughs> that, it's that one, right? Sea surface temperatures appear to be the driving force in patterns of weather and climate. But Whatever the, the temperature is, uh, of the ocean is, which is seventy five percent of the surface. That's right. So that determines mm-hmm. the temperature of the air above it, and then that determines what the temperature of your, the land is. Okay, so right? th- that's a fact. That is a fact. Okay, that's a known fact. So now, what happens when you increase the sea surface temperature? If you increase the sea surface temperature, yeah, the well, whole temperature of the globe will increase. It will increase, won't it? Okay, I mean, so the air temperatures, right? The air temperature, yeah. that's right. So there are two regions of the Pacific mm-hmm. and Atlantic, one region in each place, which anomalously heats up at various periods of time. Is and this a daily, not, monthly, or yearly thing? It's a, it's a more than yearly thing. It occurs once every three or four years or five mm-hmm. years. It, it's an irregular pattern. And the irregular patterns of both La Nino, no, La Nina in El the Nino. Atlantic, which was recently discovered, and El Nino in the Pacific off the, it's in the, at the zone of the equator northwest of Australia. In the Pacific Ocean, uh, sort of uh, to the southern part of the Philippines uh, near Borneo, there's a large swath of ocean, which routinely, I I shouldn't say routinely, but which when it heats up, alters the circulation patterns of the ocean. And altering the circulation patterns of the ocean affects the temperatures. And in El Nino years... Mm -hmm. Uh, for instance, you get a warming trend along the coast of South America on the western slope, and the Galapagos Islands are impacted. And the food sources for the seals disappear because the, the uh, sardines uh, are temperature dependent as to where they live. They don't swim around the Galapagos because the water around the Galapagos is now too warm. And the seals that are dependent upon this food source start to starve. So those are some small... Uh, explanations as so to what these happens. Are, these are Pacific anomaly, anomalies. One right? is a Pacific anomaly. That's La, uh, El Nino. And the other is in Atlantic. And the, other, the other is, they discovered this more recently, but there is an anomalous uh, warming of the North Atlantic, which occurs at irregular intervals as well, and similarly affects the flows of ocean currents and the temperatures of the ocean currents, and therefore the air temperature as well. So that alters the patterns of weather. Mm-hmm. All right. Now those are weather altering patterns. Okay? Do they affect our weather up here? Of course, of course. they do. Of yeah. course they do. They, they do. Look at if you go to the drought monitor. Mm-hmm. Go to. Uh, I'm serious. Go to the drought monitor right now. Just have a drought monitor. Okay. Got and it. You're going to get a map monitor. of the United States. Dot unl. Dot edu. Right. That's right. And in California, it's very red. You see. It's almost black. It's so red. That's correct. And yeah. it, it, it indicates that California, the southern part of California is particularly, has suffered a drought now, which has lasted over a year. Mm-hmm. Has this corresponded at all with El Nino? Yeah, I guess the answer is yes. Yeah, I think the so we is currently yes. have an El Nino in the Pacific. Right? I believe that's true, but we could actually check right now by just going to the USGS site, which is part of the drought monitor site. So yeah. USGS, say... El Nino year and see whether or not this year pops up or not. Oh, it's certain years that you get this anomalous That's warm. That's right. It's not every year. It's not oh, here every we go. Year. All right, so, so is this an El Nino year? Uh, the El Nino index. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty interesting. Yeah. See this. This. How does this relate to parasitic diseases? And the answer is it relates very much to parasitic diseases and infectious disease transmission in general because now you're dealing with the environment. Yeah. Well, the last. Uh, Strong El Nino year was right. uh, El Nino 19, uh, 1997 and La Nina 2010. Uh-huh. You know, they're weak, moderate, and strong right. years. So what are we suffering from now that has caused this drought situation in the southern part of California? 2014, there's not a lot of data. Not so a lot far. because it's young. I mean, it's a young year so far, right? We're only in, in 2013 March. was not a strong year, I think. No, but I think as the winter set in in 2013, I think the suspicion was that we were beginning another 
El Nino year. Interesting. And so this temp, this, uh, the, these anomalous air masses yes. could have, have changed the temperatures. Well, ocean masses. It's an ocean mass that's anomalous. Which makes the air. Right, exactly. So right. it's actually the ocean that warms up anomalously. That's correct. And causes atmospheric right. changes. That's so right. these could have influenced the temperature in both Ethiopia and Colombia. It could have. Yeah, La Nina and El Nino could have infected both areas separately. La uh, Nina is the is the Atlantic one. That's correct. Okay. The, so the interesting part of that part of the equation of climate change is what causes El Nino? What is the basis for the warming trend? Okay, so if you look under yeah. the water, right, and it's pretty deep in some of those areas, right? right. It's near the right. Mariana's, Mariana's Trench, in fact. Mm -hmm. You can find tremendous numbers of underwater volcanoes, huh. and many of them are active. This is in the Pacific. Yeah, this is where Krakatoa was, right, in the uh, archipelagos of uh, the Indonesian archipelago. So... It's huge. It's on a big tectonic plate. It's active. There's a lot of twisting and turning of all kinds of um, uh, subterranean uh, landscapes. And this generates tremendous amounts of heat, which could uh, affect the water above it. Okay. And therefore the temperature. And it doesn't always occur, as you can see when, let's say, for instance, something we're all familiar with when Fukushima occurred. That was a once, maybe in a lifetime event for Japan. But this is more regular. El Nino events are more regular. And um, <coughs> they could relate to volcanic activity. But what That's about the, the La Nina events? There are no volcanoes up there. Uh, there Japan. might be. No, the, oh, yeah. Are you kidding? Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, yeah. <laughs> which if you go online, you can see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Mm -hmm. Using side-scanning radar, you can actually see it exactly how high these mountains are that are underwater and some of them are higher than Mount Everest as I was led to believe the the flow of material out of the mid-Atlantic ridge is causing the plates to move apart and that's where South America and Africa actually started to move apart mm -hmm. that was the beginning of the mid-Atlantic ridge guess where the mid-Atlantic ridge can be seen without having to go under the water where Iceland Am I really off the coast no that is Iceland. Iceland is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. You can ridge. see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in Iceland. So Iceland has huge numbers of active volcanoes. And one of them yeah, went off right. last year and spoiled air traffic throughout Europe for many, many months. So, or at least weeks. The longest mountain range in the world. <laughs> correct. 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 <laughs> well, look, there it is. Yeah, it goes right up to Iceland. <laughs> it goes right through it. It's right through it. So the point is you shouldn't be able to see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge because it's a very dangerous place. Yeah. All right, but there's a tremendous amount of heat generated from that. So volcanoes yeah, okay. Makes sense. blow up and make islands all over the place in the North Atlantic. So that's maybe the basis for the heating zone for La Nina. All right, I'm, now I'm not a geologist, and it, it might sound like I am, but I do read the literature. A lot of it I understand, but some I don't. So if any geologists are out there listening and want to contribute to this conversation, we highly encourage you to do so. Maybe you have a better explanation for both of these. Okay. Uh, Phenomena. Here's they have some other graphs, right? Presenting right, this, right? I've not got the paper right. Here is um, they have two which are really nice, which show the cumulative number of cases, yes, versus the altitude. That's right. 1994 and 97. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you yeah. can see from 94 to 97, the, ca the cases shift to higher altitudes. That's true. It's quite clear for that both Ethiopia and for Colombia. Correct. Um, and they say that this shows that uh, in two highland regions on two separate continents, increases in temperatures extended the distribution of malaria That's to higher right. elevation. Is the implication exactly is that right. global warming will increase the risk of contracting highland malaria in the future. So in other words, it's going to keep on If temperatures increasing. continue to rise. That's right. That's right. You have to throw that in there because if temperatures. Now, the naysayers of all this will say, well, how can you possibly predict the future? when you can't even tell what happened in the past. And so they can turn around and say, well, we can now tell what happened in the past because we kept close records of both the cases, the altitudes, and the temperatures. So we've got these things correlated now, okay? You want to doubt this mm -hmm. result? Go for it. And I highly recommend that you should live at a higher altitude because you can avoid malaria. And if, if you think you can do that, of course, you're crazy. Here's they, have the data. they have another figure showing the temporal trends in temperature and malaria separately for Ethiopia. And you can see the temperature is yeah. basically gradually increasing, as are the That's number right. of cases. That's and right. they mention that it, the Got temperature right. seems to already have uh, influenced sure. the burden of malaria in sure. Ethiopia. And 
so what's wrong with all of this? What's it's wrong? Because there is something wrong with this, okay? So, I mean, I'm putting the wrong word in quotes. You shouldn't be able to see it. You These shouldn't? changes should have happened more gradually. How do you know? Why? Because if you look back in time, you can see a more gradual increase in the temperature. But right now, we're increasing the temperature. Much more rapidly? Yeah. So it's called rapid climate change. Okay. And the rapid part is the part that we think human activity has contributed to. The rapid part. Not climate change. Climate change has been the thing that defines this planet. Got it. Right. But the rapid part yeah, doesn't. that's the problem. That's right. All right, I want to come back to that. Sure. But first, they say here, it has been argued that the global effect of climate change on malaria will be negligible as compared with the potential impact of intervention and improved socioeconomic conditions. So they're saying we should be able to deal with this. Well, as we do in other places, too, of course. You know what their estimate is for every degree rise? Go on. An additional 400,000 infections per That's year. Incredible. So how many infections per year are there? I don't altogether know. Altogether, throughout the world? How many, Dixon? Well, the estimate is a billion. But other people, good people, that are also keeping track of this in places like specific countries, like Nigeria, for instance. Yeah. Nigeria's population is some 75 or 78 million people. The claim is that that whole country catches malaria every year. Everybody catches it. Mm. Well, if that's the case, and they're not reported because most people don't get sick from it. Why? Because they've already had it, and they can fight it off, basically. So to measure the actual incidence and prevalence of malaria is extremely difficult. The only thing we can measure accurately is infant mortality rates. And when wow. we do yeah. that, yeah. we find it's about 0.1% of all the cases of malaria. So mm -hmm. malaria is, it really doesn't kill a lot of people. No, that's not true. It doesn't, out of 10,000 people, it doesn't kill a lot of people. But out of an entire Earth's population's worth, it kills a lot of people every year. So what if there are a billion and a half cases? 400,000 a year additional looks like a drop in the bucket. Well, but over time, it might increase the number of cases annually to well over 3 billion. Yeah. Because a lot of people live at higher altitudes that are now immune from attack because of their geographic location. So here they give some numbers for Ethiopia. They, have, yeah. they say they have a large population at high altitudes. Right, they do. 37 million people are at risk, which is 43% of the total population. Right. And they estimate an additional 2.8 million infections would occur in the population younger than 15 years of age, yeah, exactly. living at altitudes where the disease would intensify. Right. So it's a child. So they're disease. saying basically... Yeah. This is a big problem, a and big we problem. shouldn't just assume we're going to handle That's it with, right. you know, mosquito nets and right. interventions. Right. But so I that can hear some people say, "Who cares? It's Ethiopia. What do we care?" I can hear that. I well, don't that's not that. right. Well, we have but to care for all right. humans. Or Colombia. Who cares about them? They don't care about us. In fact, they produce all of our cocaine. <laughs> we care less about them. Well, somehow. I don't think that's a reason to perpetuate hatred. Hey, you got it right. I mean, of <laughs> course, none of these arguments make any sense at all at the global Look, there climate. are many people out there that hate us and that hate other people no, and do nasty for things. for stupid reasons. But that doesn't change my desire to prevent infectious diseases. Oh, that's right. It doesn't devalue life just no. because of some stupid people that live in that area. That's right. So that brings us to the question of yeah. what can we do? Because right. we can't do anything about El Nino. Nope. But we, can't. we don't. We didn't induce El Nino. I don't think yeah. we could take responsibility for that one. What do we do about the global? We could acceleration and put on a better change? alarm system. What if we could detect El Ninos very early on? Right. We could then say, okay, everybody, hunker down. This is going to be a malaria transmission year like you wouldn't believe. So I want you to redouble your efforts in terms of cleaning up those swamps and uh, malaria control at the mosquito level. Um, maybe we could institute better public health measures for this. Uh, well, maybe Dixon, distribute more bed nets. If we <laughs> eradicated malaria, this wouldn't be yeah, an well, issue. Well, eradication is a tough one, right? Well, there's no reservoir, right? I know that. That 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 I know because you're a polio person, <laughs> and, and there's no reservoir for polio. And polio was essentially eliminated. Wait a minute, we've still got a lot of polio still now. Uh, 
I know. That's another You know, story. there is, is a virus for which we have a great vaccine, right. two great vaccines. Right, and we can't even get rid of that one. Well, we're close, but we're, that last bit is very hard. Political commitment, social buy-in, and money. It's tough. When you put all those things together, controlling anything... Dixon, we just difficult. need to make a mosquito that can't support <laughs> malarial growth and let, <laughs> release That's it. Right. Right? People are thinking about and that. We talked to people about <clears throat> we that. We did, we did. Or a good vaccine that uh, everybody can handle. Good paper, Dixon. Very interesting. I'm glad you liked it. All right. It. We have some email. Right. We have some letters. Me, can, do you want me to read the first one, or would you like to read the I'm first one? I'm going to try to get back online first. All right. We'll read the first one while you're getting <laughs> online. Richard <laughs> writes... You going to listen? I'm listening. Hi, Vincent and Dixon. I enjoy TWIP and often recommend it to my students. I'm a parasitologist, primarily a Leishmaniac. Right. But I have learned a lot from TWIP. I find it more educational and entertaining than car talk. Oh, good. There you go. <laughs> Excellent. Can we get their money? Uh, no, actually. They're going out. They're not on. No, they're not recording anymore. So you're listening to old car talk. Why don't they just put us on the radio? So more people could listen. Are we too boring? <laughs> you want to put a request out there to NPR that should pick up TWIP? You know, we could cut it to 15 minutes if we could get on NPR yeah, weekly. We could do that. We could do that. But I like talking a long time, don't you? <laughs> I, I like talking for as long as people will listen. Here. <laughs> the discussion on TWIP 67 about nitrile drugs for Chagas disease was excellent, but I wanted to point out a common misconception about the amastigote which does, in fact, have a flagellum. Ah. It is a non-modal intracellular stage, but it retains a short flagellum, which is clearly visible in electron micrographs. The same is true for the Leishmania amastigote. Ha. Huh. Okay, Dixon, now you know. Now Because you know. said it didn't have a flagellum. Yeah, no, I, I, I... The flagellum in all stages of these trypanosomatid parasites arises from a structure called the basal body and emerges from the cell body in a specialized region of the cell surface called the flagellar pocket. Right. No, I knew that. The flagellar pocket is an invagination of the surface membrane, which appears to be the only site of endo and exocytosis in trypanosomatids, while in modile forms, promastigotes, epimastigotes, or tripomastigotes, the flagellum extends for some distance outside the cell and gives the cell motility. Right. In amastigotes, it does not emerge from the flagellar pocket. However, right. while the non-emergent flagellum cannot confer motility, this does not mean it has no function. One possibility is that the flagellum is a sensory organelle uh -huh. reporting on the environment of the parasite. In fact, the trypanosomatid flagellum is structurally and evolutionarily related to organelles that are responsible for sensing invertebrates. Sure, our sure. factory sensors in our noses are a good example. That's right. Uh, saying my nose is a tail. <laughs> we, how do you say trypanosomatid or trypanosomatid? Either or. <laughs> trypanosomatid. We have shown that, <laughs> that modal stages of these parasites can correspond, can respond to chemical stimuli in the environment by swimming towards or away from them. Amastigotes can't swim. But right. it may still be important for them to ch sense changes in their environment. Sure. Maybe we could compromise amastigotes by perturbing their sensory apparatus. What a great idea. One other point, you cited plasmodium as an example of a protozoa that does not have a flagellum. Uh -oh. In fact, the male gametocyte <laughs> undergoes a striking uh -oh. process called exflagellation. <laughs> oh, no, of course. To produce modal flagellated no, no, that's gametes true. That's true. That's true. That's in the true. mosquito gut. This right. is the only flagellate form in the complex plasmodium life cycle. Sure, there are more sure. exceptions than rules in biology. Tell me all about it. That's, That's absolutely true. You know what? I, this is great because this is, this is an augmentation of a, a basic knowledge base, which can now be detailed by the listeners. This is yeah, fantastic. well, this is crowdsourcing. This is how that Thanks did. so much for doing a great job with trip, TWIP, not Whip. TRIP. <laughs> That's right. All the best. Richard is uh, at the Institute of Infection, Immunity, and Inflammation right. in, at the University of Glasgow. How about that? Isn't that great that it he is. discovered yeah, TWIP yep. and he said he's learning a lot from it, even though he can correct you? Well, now, well, he's adding and correcting. That's great. We accept both. Dixon, you can't modes. know everything, can you? I, Lord knows. No, absolutely. You ever been to Glasgow? Yeah, I have, actually. It's a great place. What did you do there? I, I stayed with Derek Wakeland when he was still teaching there, and um, I had a great time. I spent a week. That was my first visit to Europe, and um, 
Finished up with a nice bottle of Glen Morangi, twelve year old. I was there in twenty twelve. I, yeah. I went to yeah. uh, give a lecture. Yep. And I got that plaque, which is on my wall there. See, that's nice. I do see the plaque, and it's a wonderful. And, and one of the professors wanted to give me a bottle of single malt, but I couldn't bring it back. <laughs> on the plane. Oh, yeah, and I wasn't checking any luggage. Should have brought it back. Then. Can you read the Hillary email, sure. Dixon sure. de Pommier? Hillary, Wright. Hillary writes, "Hi there, professors de Pommier and Rackin Yellow. I'm a final year student." doctor from sunny Melbourne. Notice I pronounced it Melbourne, not Melbourne. It's Melbourne, that's right. Melbourne, that's how they pronounce it. Hmm. Today, it's 24 degrees Celsius, sunny with a 15 kilometer per hour southeasterly. Just writing to let you know how much of an inspiration your podcasts have been. Wow. I have always had a passion for parasitology ever since my undergraduate microbiology days, not to mention an unfortunate encounter with the 1998 Sydney Giardia outbreak. Oh, brother. The entertaining, insightful, and always educational content of your TWIP podcast has kept me inspired and engaged through many long commutes. I count you guys amongst my greatest inspirations and must confess, I have named two of my favorite zebrafish after you. Oh, thank you. Along with other luminaries such as uh, Freddie Mercury and Sir Ed Hillary, as well as some very inspiring pharmacology professors. Nothing more to add. Just keep up the amazing work. Cheers, Hillary. Melbourne. Thank you, Hillary. I'm honored. Melbourne. 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 That's. I'm going there Melbourne. this summer. Yes, you are. You should go to the Victoria Market. It's a wonderful place. I'm sure Hillary will agree. Hillary, Maybe can she'll you, show it to you. I want her to send a picture of her of a, the zebrafish. Absolutely. Named after us. <laughs> there are two of them, right? Yeah, I want to know how they she can tell them to apart. apart. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Please sell it, send us a picture. That's pretty right. cool. Right, no, we would like that. The next one is from Pete, who writes, Hi, Professor Guys, Emeritus or otherwise. Right. It's you. You're the Emeritus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've been listening to the trio for a couple of years now, ever since you were on Skeptic's Guide. Oh, nice. Recently, for some unknown reason, I downloaded the early TWIP episodes. (laughs) So, to the question. About six months ago, I had a holiday in Laos, probably the best I have ever had. That's a great place. I was in the countryside one day at a village home stay when my host invited me to a celebratory lunch Mm -hmm. at a small local school. Mm -hmm. I ate some well-cooked and delicious pork, but eschewed the dish based on blood, which I am glad they warned me about. Right. After many rice wines and a few local beers, we (laughs) retired to the guest of honor's home where we ate and drank even more. Goodness. One of the dishes was produced from a banana leaf, and I had a nibble whereupon someone informed me it was cured pork with spices, but Mm -hmm. it was delicious. I do distinctly remember saying, that is not good falang, foreigner food. (laughs) So, to a couple of questions. One, could there have been trichinella in the blood-based dish? No. I have no idea how much it was cooked. Unless the blood had some meat in it, too, but if it was just blood, the answer is no. Okay, number two, how many organisms... Could I have possibly <laughs> ingested in just a few grams of cured pork? That varies greatly. Of course, if the pork had so many larvae in it that your health was at risk from just a few ounces, it's possible that the pig would have died first. Mm-hmm. So I, right now I wouldn't worry. How long ago was this? Six months ago. That You're well beyond the critical stage for clinical trichinellosis, even if you had acquired Assuming it. Assuming he's alive still. Oh, he's alive. Of course he is. And happy, too, that he took the trip. I hope you went to Luang Prabang. I went there, too, and it was a great, great, great There's another, another question. Number three, could I have developed an immune response from that, which will benefit me in later years? I, I know where you're getting that question from because we talked about Yul Brenner. Uh, right, right. <laughs> later, he developed a sarcoma and uh, didn't die right away because his immune system was hyped by the trichinella infection. Well, let's say if you acquired trichinella in small doses and it's still there, uh, indeed, it does have a general effect on both Th1 and Th2 uh, immune responses uh, to the benefit of the host because the parasite, apparently, through evolutionary selection, would rather see you die from something else than from it. And uh, that's the hypothesis, at least, in when, under which we're operating. So the answer is yes. A little bit of trichinella goes a long way, but a lot of trichinella, you won't go a long way. So that's the that's the basic uh, Dividing point there. I think eating raw anything is risky. Mm-hmm. Eating raw pork is extremely risky. And eating raw pork in Southeast Asia is very, very risky. So I would try not to do it if you could. But of course, 
it's tough to refuse a, a host's uh, offering, especially when you've had a few too many to drink. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. All yeah. right, Dixon, you are next with Josh. Right. Josh writes, thank you so much for the show. I think I speak for many listeners when I say that both of you have had a profound personal effect on my life through your mostly weekly, <laughs> weekly teaching. TWIP was a major inspiration behind my decision to leave a career in woodworking and cabinetry making to pursue a degree in biochemistry. Wow, which is off to a great start, by the way. That's, I'm so glad to hear that. On to my picks. I've been meaning to pick this one for a while. I came across the blog of Nathan Shields when it was featured in a brief by the New York Times. He's a math teacher who started making fun pancakes for his kids. I haven't actually had a chance to look at this yet, but I'm assuming that it's uh, Yeah, it's hilarious. pretty cute. He makes different pancakes. <clears throat> yeah, I thought they were hilarious, so I scrolled through it and hit the weekly pick jackpot. So apparently... Uh, so he made all these parasite pancakes. <laughs> That's, That's great. great. That's wonderful. See, he's got, oh, he's got a bot fly, a hookworm. That's tick, I love it, I love it, I love it. Flu. Wow, those are involved. Those are not Very. just... Um, I wouldn't eat any of these. You might get infected. Well, you know, they all look about the same to me. So I mean, close your eyes and enjoy yourself. This is cool. <laughs> the kids must have really loved it, though. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's a great pick. So we'll have a, the first listener pick on TWIP. Right, so this is maybe. a Twipster listener, a twip maybe? listener, yeah. My other picked pick is a The Winged Scourge, a Disney propaganda film about the spread of malaria featuring the seven dwarves. It was apparently created for the coordinator of Inter-American Affairs in 1943 for a Latin American audience. The eradication, seem, uh, the eradication method seems a bit dated, but it's pretty educational and very interesting. And by the way, <clears throat> I must add that Dr. Seuss was involved in that same campaign, and there are many, many uh, renderings of female and male mosquitoes yeah. made by Dr. Seuss, Ted Geisel, which were used also to help to uh, educate. I didn't know that Walt Disney had made this this film. Nor, nor I, actually, but uh, I think a lot of high-end personalities were involved in... Uh, the war effort at various levels, and certainly disease transmission is a big deal. Wow, that's pretty cool. In fact, cool. it's estimated that more people died of malaria during the Second World War yeah. than were shot. Public enemy number one. That's right. Anopheles, that's alias it. the malaria mosquito. Sitting at a 45-degree angle, I Look presume. at that. <laughs> that's right. This is pretty cool. Not bad. I mean, not just not bad. It's great. Oh, nice. Still valid, although you're right. The control methods are probably a bit outdated, but uh, the data are probably, probably still valid. Nice. Yep. All right. Yep. That is cool for yep. a pick. Thank you very much, Josh. The next one is from John. Well, this is a long one. This uh, should be our last, right. I guess. Right. He's, he right. writes, oh, yeah. Dear professors, <laughs> you requested more reader email, so here is more reader email. Excellent. <laughs> it is below freezing outside, and I have a bandage on my finger. Oh, dear. I'm writing again to share a paper about squirrel parasites. Again, oh. there is more than enough here to fill an episode. Huh. So this is a cue for our next episode, perhaps. <laughs> uh, Franklin's ground squirrel, Spermophilus franklini, lives in the northern prairie. Unlike the gray squirrel that bit my finger by accident, these squirrels often eat meat, catching prey as large as hares and mallards. That isn't that interesting? And he provides a reference. As omnivores, they have more parasites than their herbivorous <laughs> cousins. One, one would expect that. Here is, paras is a parasite inventory from a paper. I only recognize one genus name from TWIP. <laughs> I hope a parasitologist on your show can discuss life cycles or habits of some of the others. Huh. So AB complex, Imeria bilamellata. Right. Imeria callospermophili and Imeria spermophili. Right. I just recognized Imeria, the yeah. genus, right? We talked about That's those. Right. We did. <clears throat> That's right. The last two species' names are derived from the genus names of ground squirrels. Do they right. only infect ground squirrels? Well, the genus certainly is widespread throughout the animal kingdom, and uh, it's, a, it's a big problem among poultry raisers. Frank Perdue, when he was at his uh, height, um, was driven crazy by Imeria outbreaks in, in chickens. and uh, Is that right? Oh, yeah. So mm. the drug companies of the world uh, have always had a coccidia group that uh, develops compounds to fight off Imeria and coccidia infections in various uh, uh, commercial um, 
species that we raise for meat production. Well, I found the original paper where they isolated these from ground squirrels. Okay. Interesting. All right. All right. Uh, he's continuing. Yeah, right. Cestodes. Hymeno, Hymenolepus citelli was the most right. common cestode. Right, right. Cotinia spermophili and taenia mustelae were found in the liver. Right. And larval T. taxidiensis was found in distal muscles in the rear leg. Right. So uh, Hymenolepus is a common genus that also occurs in people. Hymenolepus mm -hmm. nana and Hymenolepus diminuta can both be found in people. They're transmitted by insect vectors. And that's interesting because you have to eat them in order to catch the infection. One is found in uh, fleas, and the other one is found mm -hmm. in uh, things like mealworms and stuff like that. The other tapeworm genus, uh, Tinea, of course, Tinea saginata, Tinea right. solium in people. And, uh, yeah. I do not recognize the first two genera. Right. Well, you just explained them. Yep. Tinea is the genus including common human infecting tapeworms. The Latin names translate as weasel tapeworm <laughs> and badger tapeworm. Hmm. I assume squirrels are among the intermediate hosts. Trematodes. Uh, right. The trematode, Alaria mustelae, was found in lungs of 6S Franklini and right. in the spleen of two individuals. Right. Plagiorchus proximus, also a trematode, was found in the small intestine of one individual. Right. I found a list of hosts and stages of Alaria mustelae in another paper. A snail, which harbors the sporocysts, yeah, producing right. cercariae, a tadpole or frog into which the cercariae penetrate and in which they become immature metacercariae or agamodistomes, here to be called mesocercariae, <laughs> a mammal, mouse, mink, or raccoon, which carries the right. metacercariae, right. and another mammal, mink or weasel, the host of the hermaphroditic adult. Since you're doing very well. <laughs> I would have designed a simpler life cycle, but nobody asked me. <laughs> it's great. I think all students of parasitology would say the same thing, by the way. Nobody asked me. I think that's, that's right. great. That's great. Nematodes. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. most common mature nematode, Physiloptera, Physiloptera yeah. spinacorda, right. was found in the stomachs of 13 individuals. Yeah. Spirura infundibuliformis. Right was found in the stomach and esophagus. Capillaria, yeah. CF hepatica, was mm. found in the liver. That's one people And Citinelima bifurcatum occurred in three individuals. Right. I do not recognize any of these genera from human-centric TWIP. Well, we didn't do the capillaria, but we could have. It's um, uh, an organism that's in the Trichurata family, and it's related to Trichurus and to Trichinella distantly, and uh, it can cause some nasty infections both in wildlife and into people. And there's one do, called Capillaria uh, philippinensis that's really very dangerous in the Philippines that people can catch. Do you think we're human-centric? We do. Or we are human-centric, although we have had some interesting non-human parasite uh, discussions. Who was, who was someone that could come on and talk all about non-human parasites extensively? Oh, I know lots of wildlife parasitologists out there that we could uh, tap into. Could, would some of them be, be able to Skype? Yeah, are some of them here great. in New York City? Uh, we don't have too many wildlife parasitologists. How about Phil D'Alessandro? He's not a wildlife parasitologist. <laughs> I'm just trying. I know, I know. I, I used to go to the meetings. Sometimes I went to the uh, ASP meetings, American Society for Parasitologists. And usually we would be by ourselves, but sometimes we would join up with another society. And the wildlife parasitologists were always the most interesting. They would study diseases <laughs> of elk and moose and wolves and fish of various kinds and it was great to talk with them because they were really uh in the trenches so to speak of of what's going on in the real world well it would be fun to get someone on because i know you're not an expert in these non-human no parasites, right? definitely not definitely not and um someone but i have heard of them because in, when i was a student i did a summer's work up at the michigan biological station in pelston right and a lot of these worms we found in many different kinds of hosts uh the name of the course, the parasitology course that I took was called Post a Host. Post a Host. <laughs> it was run by uh, a, a professor from uh, Chico State by the name of Wooden and uh, another a professor, Dr. Hendricks, from the University of North Carolina. And they were wonderful people to get to know and to um, study with. Uh, I, we would go out in the afternoon and collect roadkill, basically, <laughs> and bring them back to nice. the lab. The one that I remember most was the roadkill that I found uh, of a skunk, uh, which cleared the entire laboratory. The moment I walked in with it in a plastic bag, and I said, by the way, 
I just found a dead skunk. <laughs> Everybody in the room said, we'll see you later, and they left. And uh, it did have a certain um, skunk-like uh, smell, and that's when I found the Physiloptera, uh, which is a nematode parasite of uh, animals that uh, live all over the world, basically, and they, they acquire them uh, quite frequently. I'm refreshing your thing here because I made a few adjustments in the emails. Uh, okay. uh, the next one is very short. You can read that too then. Yeah. <laughs> it's from someone called Art Form Photographics. That was huh? the name. Who writes, thank you for your wonderful episode on parasitology number 67. Right. It was 67. What was number 67? I should know them by <laughs> heart, shouldn't <laughs> by numbers. I? That's I right. know 68 was sex in the single trypanosome. That's right. I think that was the nitrile warheads. Yes. No, ah. I'm sorry. That wasn't. That was they find each other delightful. Excellent. I'm glad <laughs> that they was liked it. The genetic and molecular basis of drug resistance in schistosoma. Oh, yeah. Mansoni. Oh, yes. And you can take the next one from David. I'll be happy to do that. David writes, Vince and Dick. Really glad I found your TWIP podcast. I started on episode one, and I'm working my way up so that I am not at the current episode yet. The information you provide has been a great help in my invertebrate zoology course. Oh, that's great. I have been able to bring a lot of additional information on the parasites we study in the course due to TWIP. Keep up the great work, David. Thank you, David. Texas A&M. Yeah, yeah, great school. Didn't we... Talk about that in a recent podcast that we remains did, to be We released. did, we did, because Texas A&M... Uh, What's A&M stand for? Uh, it's agriculture and mining. Um, Texarkana. That's, you ever been there? Not to Texarkana, no. Whenever I think Texas of Texas, I think of barbecue. Oh, you should. <laughs> That's one now, good thing Now to I'm getting about. hungry. Uh, uh, listen, it's almost lunch. We can go out. Just make sure you don't have any raw pork. That's all. Uh, the next one's from Jim. Right. I wrote Twiv last week about experiment.com, but now have reviewed the 140 projects shown <laughs> and see four related to parasites, lung fluke, oh, mosquitoes, parasitic zombies, worm cures. Uh -huh. In case this approach will interest your listeners, if you support a project, you gain access to progress reports, but after the deadline, you can't contribute. Something for fence sitters to keep in mind. Uh -huh. I contributed to one project, but it may not reach its goal in which case the contribution is returned and I can use it again elsewhere. Nice. I was a little concerned at first about the qualifications of the researchers and couldn't find any details, <laughs> but now see the site provides background on each project. All right. Also, the site has been around for several years, starting out with the name Mycorrhiza, which right. might be of interest to Professor Schachter. So this is interesting. This experiment.com, yeah. people post... Uh, it's a crowdfunding platform right. for research. They yeah, post yeah, their projects. Sure. You can contribute, and if you do, yeah. uh, you get to see progress reports. Yeah, 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 yeah. So check that nice. out. That's pretty neat. Very nice. Very nice. Should we uh, do one more? If you wish. Do you have the next one up there from Suzanne? I do. All right. Why don't you read that? Suzanne writes, I write too much. No, you don't write too much, Suzanne. Thank the you. The issue with people being <laughs> anti-evolution has less to do with a specific religion than with the rise of fundamentalism. Plenty of Christians don't believe the Bible is factual in the same way scientific evidence is. It's just the ones who don't want to try to squeeze creationism into science. Who do want to. I'm sorry, I'll reread that. It's just the ones who do want to try to squeeze creationism into science. I believe the main fight against Darwin's theory of evolution began a century or so ago as a reaction to the so-called social Darwinism at a time when eugenics was a somewhat popular idea. I sat through a sermon not too long ago at my parents' church by a preacher who assumed altruism had no place in evolution. I really wanted to stand up and correct him, but figured my parents wouldn't forgive me. <laughs> it's really frustrating down here in Texas, where evolution hasn't been taught in a lot of schools for generations, to the point that some people don't even understand what they're trying to keep their kids from learning. And really, it's just a noisy minority causing the problem. A lot of people who go along with uh, creationists or just don't think about it enough to care aren't even really creationists. If you mention natural selection, they don't bat an eye. <laughs> they understand that the flu can mutate. It's just the word evolution that conjures thoughts of monkeys and leaving the poor to die or something. 
<laughs> so I appreciate that point of view, Suzanne. And um, Texas, at the college level, is one of the world leaders in supplying evidence for the Darwin's theory of evolution. So I, I think that there's a schism that breaks down at the uh, the K through no, the K through twelve rather, and then into college. Uh, there's a, a big disconnect. In fact, there are some fundamental colleges throughout Texas, but most of them are very forward-looking schools that attract an international crowd and and allow all the ideas to be expressed. Yeah, you know, if 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 schools were to pr- to propose <coughs> that we're going to study evolution as a theory. But mm-hmm. we're going to study creationism as a belief system. That would solve the problem. Because you can test an hypothesis. You can test theories. There's no way in the world that you can test creationism. So you just have to believe it or you don't. And that's the simple truth. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, well. Thank you again uh, for raising yeah, that I issue. I think that's, that's pretty important. We yeah, were talking about issue. that the last twip, right? Yeah, we that's were right. talking about that's evolution right. and yeah, that's right. people not believing that's in it right. and compatibility with religion and so forth, right? Yeah. yeah. Because the priest had written to us. Right. Suzanne, don't worry. You don't write Don't get much. discouraged. Do not <laughs> you write. will never turn your pastor but into you an evolutionist. Uh, <laughs> she thinks she writes too much, but that's not true. Maybe your parents can be turned. <laughs> we like to hear from you. Right. All right, this is TWIP69. You can find it at iTunes and also at microworld.org slash TWIP. If you like the show, a good way you can help us to help us stay visible, and that is to go to iTunes and put some stars on the show or write a few words. That helps to keep it visible, apparently, so that more people can discover it and learn how cool this world is of parasites that help keep populations in check. Parasites, both big and small. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> you can send us your questions and comments, of course. We love to get them. We absolutely live for them. We do. We do. Twip at twiv.tv. It enriches the show. It does. It's great. And we love answering them and getting feedback and feeling that you're here with us in the studio. That's right. That's even right. though it's just me and Dixon and... The wind outside today. A cold, cold day. In <laughs> you can find Dixon De Palmier at trichinella.org, at medicalecology.com, and at verticalfarm.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. And Pleasure. you're at the uh, you're at the Huffington Post, right? <laughs> I've only done one. You know, I can't really say. I know I'm you, you still <laughs> you still have only done one. <laughs> I have. But you do write on your blog, Vertical I do. Farm, I do. right? I do. I do. I do. Where there is a relatively recent. Post. Yeah, well, it's about a week and a half old. Yeah. So check that out. Yep. And again, thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. I'm uh, Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. The music that you hear that begins and ends TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find all of his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.